So good evening, everybody. Welcome to Museum After Hours. I'm your host for this evening, Sarah Parsons of the uh, Archives, and tonight we're joined by Dr. Stephen Kahn. Dr. Kahn is the W.E. Smith Professor of History at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Am I not visible? <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Uh, Dr. Kahn is the author of numerous books, and he is recently, he's currently completing a new one titled Rethinking Rural. So tonight's presentation will be focused on the urban-rural divide in American history. We are a nation of urbanites, and yet we are filled with people who don't like cities very much. The rural-urban divide is one of, nation, of the nation's oldest political rifts. The result has been an ever-widening debate over who, urban or rural, is a real American. Dr. Kahn will explore the deep roots of the American hostility towards our cities and ask questions about our continuing nostalgia for rural life. Throughout the presentation, please use the QA button at the bottom of your screen to pose questions as they come to you. And afterwards, we will get to as many as we can. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Kahn. Thank you so much for that introduction. And let me just say that I'm uh, delighted to be here. Where am I exactly? It, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not in Topeka, though I wish I were. Uh, these presentations are, are for me a lot more fun in person, but I do appreciate the opportunity to come to you at least in two dimensions rather than three. Uh, for the talk this evening, and, and I'm delighted that you're here. If you're here at 6.30 on a, on a beautiful early summer evening, you must really want to hear what I have to say, and I appreciate that very much. Let me just go right ahead and start sharing the screen here so that we can get this underway. And I'm hoping, let me pause there just to make sure the slides are up. If somebody could give me a, uh, an indication of that just so that we're all okay. Are we good? We are good, I can see them. Okay, well then I'm gonna assume everybody can. Okay, so yes, this is the topic of my uh, talk tonight. What I wanna do is to put forward um, uh, uh, what I see as this, as this uh, central dilemma in American political life, American cultural life, uh, rooted in about 200 years of American history, and then maybe put some questions to us at the end, which we can pick up uh, when we have our uh, Q&A when I'm finished. So let me start where, where, where the introduction left me. Let me start with this essential American paradox. Uh, we are a nation uh, between 75% and maybe 78% of us now live in metropolitan regions of 500,000 people or more. We are an urbanized nation, a heavily urbanized nation. Uh, this has been one of the most consistent trend lines throughout the history of the United States. When the Constitution was ratified, let's call it 1790, in that first US census, about 5% of us were urbanites, and now nearly 80% of us are. That, that trend towards greater and greater urbanization all through the 19th century, all through the 20th century, and it continues into the 21st. I throw up this little map, this little graphic here, to give you uh, another way of thinking about these numbers. Half of all Americans, 50%, live in a total of 143 counties. Uh, some of them are so small you can't even quite see them. Uh, you know, Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul up there in Minnesota barely registers as a blip, uh, and yet, you know, it's it's a metropolitan area of nearly 2 million people. The paradox, however, is that culturally and politically, we are a nation filled with people who don't like cities very much. And that, it seems to me, is a real dilemma, a real challenge, and indeed, I would offer a real problem as we think about what the future is going to look like. An urban nation filled with people who think they should be living on the farm. What do I mean when I'm talking about that urban hostility? Well, let's go back, shall we? Not that far uh, long ago uh, to the election, uh, that the presidential election most recently. 
which was in many ways the most aggressively, hostily anti-urban campaign that I can remember, maybe ever. Uh, the Republican uh, uh, candidate, uh, Donald Trump, uh, lambasted cities over and over again. Some of this was just his own hostility towards places that vote Democratic. Some of it was racially coded. It continued after the election. It was summarized, I think, most nice, uh, most, most succinctly uh, during, I think it was the second presidential debate. I think it was in October. Uh, when he warned that somehow the votes were going to be thrown in Philadelphia, and he said bad things happen in Philadelphia. Um, I happen to be coming to you from Philadelphia at the moment. Uh, the, um, the, what, you're, what you're seeing there is actually being modeled by my daughter, uh, who also lives in Philadelphia. And uh, this, I think, has been actually adopted as the city's now official tourist and uh, marketing slogan. Bad things happen in Philadelphia. It became a joke uh, in Philadelphia because, again, it just seems so uh, hyperbolically, aggressively anti-urban. Uh, so we are still, though, as I said, at, uh, at this point, uh, over three quarters of us live in metropolitan areas, that anti-urban, that, uh, that hostility toward the city still resonates powerfully with lots and lots and lots of Americans, including, obviously, many Americans who live in metropolitan areas. Let's go back to the 2016 election because I happen to have better graphics for this than I the, the ones from 2020 yet aren't quite as as the same. So here's what the election looked like. You'll remember this, I assume. This is what it'll look like state by state. And as you can see, uh, most of the states are red. Um, here's what it looked like by county. Uh, and as you can see, it looks even redder and redder and redder uh, because, as we all know. Uh, Donald Trump won uh, well over 2,600 of those 3,100 counties. Hillary Clinton only won 487 of them. But she won the places where people actually live. And so, as you will remember, in the popular tally, uh, she wound up winning by about 3 million votes. It's also the case, uh, at least by one estimate, that the counties that Hillary Clinton wound up winning, uh, constituted anywhere from 60 to 65 percent of the nation's GDP. So Clinton won in the counties where people live and where the economy is most uh, uh, prosperous. Donald Trump won the counties where fewer people live and where the economy is much less big, much less energetic, and so forth. But because of the way our politics are structured, uh, Donald Trump won the presidency, despite losing the popular tally by 3 million votes. Uh, a, a, a percent, we've, had, we've had four elections in our history where the winner of the popular vote did not win in the Electoral College, two in the late 19th century, uh, the election of 2000, and now the election of 2016, far and away, this is the largest discrepancy between uh, the popular vote winner and, uh, and the person who actually won in the Electoral College, indicating again that the population is now concentrated in fewer and fewer, larger and larger places. This is, as I said, uh, this, this kind of anti-urban bias, or we could put it the other way, the privileging of rural politics, the privileging of rural votes is baked into our system, the electoral college for sure. And now we're all experts on that, having gone through that uh, strange election uh, uh, six years ago. Um, it's what I call the tyranny of Wyoming. Uh, and, and no offense intended if anybody's from Wyoming, but Wyoming has fewer than 600,000 residents. I used to teach at Ohio State University before I moved to Miami University, America's largest institution. I think I've taught classes bigger than Wyoming when I was at Ohio State, but Wyoming uh, gets two senators. So, you know, a, a senator each uh, for about 275,000 people. State of California has nearly 39 million people. It also gets two senators. So guess whose votes, in essence, count more? 
whose representation matters more. And because of the way the electoral college system work, right? Wyoming's votes are disproportionately represented uh, in the electoral college system. So not just about presidential politics either. In 2016, Democratic senators uh, Democratic candidates running for Senate seats, and remember about a third of them are up uh, every every cycle, uh, won a total of 45.2 million votes. Republican candidates running for Senate that year won 39.2 million, so a discrepancy of about 6 million votes. And the result was a 52 to 48 Republican majority. That's because Wyoming gets its two senators, and so does Idaho, and so does Alaska, uh, and places again where where uh, where nobody lives necessarily, but where where the politics, uh, where where the representation has uh, become uh, uh, disproportionate to the population. In fact, that's deliberate. That's the way the Constitution is designed because the Constitution itself was framed by a number of people who themselves were deeply suspicious of American cities. Thomas Jefferson wasn't at the Constitutional Convention, but he certainly exemplified uh, the, this hostility that many of those founding figures had toward American cities, even though at the time, American cities were quite small. They were suspicious of cities. They did not want Americans to become urbanized. Uh, I think this is true pretty much for, for most of the founders, except maybe Ben Franklin, who really was uh, you know, a, a, a deeply rooted urban figure. Uh, so here's one of uh, Benjamin, uh, Thomas Jefferson's um, uh, nastier quotes about cities. What, what terrified the founders was that somehow if, if, if people lived in cities, they would become corrupt. And I mean that in the 18th century sense of the term. Uh, the only way to preserve virtue, which is another wonderful 18th century term that was used quite a lot, would, would be if people lived out in rural areas, if they were farmers. And that's Jefferson's vision of the United States, independent, small scale farmers. Uh, as I said, it doesn't happen. Uh, people, uh, despite Jefferson's um, admonitions, uh, Americans have always been urbanizing from the very beginning of the United States. Fast forward 50 years, and here is transcendentalist Henry David Thoreau, himself deeply hostile to the own, his own uh, neighborhood of Boston. Uh, he hardly ever went there. He avoided it as much as he could. Uh, he didn't have much use for the Bostonians who uh, lived there in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. I'll jump to the end of the 19th century and give you a quote here from Henry Adams. Uh, if you don't know Henry Adams, a fascinating figure, he is the grandson of President John Quincy Adams, the great grandson of John Adams, the second president of the United States. He is therefore of that Adams family. And uh, he himself had a remarkable career. Uh, his father, Charles Francis, was uh, the American ambassador to London during the Civil War. Henry Adams went there as his personal secretary. That was the key diplomatic role during the American Civil War, the key position. Uh, Adams, looking back on his life, uh, posited this, uh, this dichotomy, Boston the city, Quincy the small town. And Quincy has always been right. This is where the Adams family is really from. Quincy represented a moral principle. Uh, the principle of being against Boston. And I think that nicely captures, this is from uh, Henry Adams' uh, very remarkable autobiography. Uh, I think this captures um, uh, the, 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 that, that privileging that we have had in our culture of rural life. It is moral. It's not just that somehow it's healthier for you or uh, it's, it's better work or you have a bigger yard or anything in material. There's a moral principle here that we Americans have collectively believed in for a very long time. Country equals good and virtuous, city equals bad and wicked. And as I said, I love this quote from Henry Adams because I think it encapsulates all of that quite nicely. Adams is writing very early 
in the 20th century at the end of his life. Let's take a look at the city at the turn of the 20th century. Because as I said, despite all of this cultural baggage associated with rural life, rural living, farming, uh, countryside and so forth, Americans are in fact busy flocking to, uh, to American cities. 35% of the country, a third of us by 1900 are living in the 200 largest cities. But more to the point, two thirds of the industrial production of this country is taking place in those cities. This is after all the moment when industrial capitalism uh, uh, matures and 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 you know you know the story here. It's it's Carnegie Steel plants, it's uh, automobile plants in Detroit, it's um, it's uh, steel plants in in Cleveland, it's the stockyards of Chicago. This is the industrial age, and the industrial economy is an urban economy. Full stop. Uh, so people are flocking in for those jobs uh, in those industrial plants, and cities are the dynamos now, both economically but also socially of the nation, despite the fact that we have had this ethos, uh, which, which posits a deep suspicion of all things urban. The Congregational Minister Josiah Strong, again, summarized that very nicely in 1898. This is from a book he published that, the, that this new civilization, the problem of the 20th century will be the problem of the city. Uh, we are now facing an urban age. Josiah Strong wasn't happy about this, but he wanted to warn Americans that this is where the arrows were all pointing and we had all better get used to that and better uh, uh, accommodate ourselves, uh, re respond to it somehow, because American life was increasingly urban life. So why are people so upset with cities? What's wrong with cities? Uh, what, 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 is, what, is the, the, what are the constituents of what I call, I've been calling this anti-urbanism? You can see it. an image there, an early 20th century image of uh, Chicago, Lake Michigan, looking out, looking back from uh, Michigan Avenue, sorry, looking back from Lake Michigan there uh, early in the 20th century. Well, let me, let me describe the nature of this anti-urbanism in two parts. Part one uh, is a reaction against what people called at the time concentration. What they meant was there were too many people crowded together in these urban spaces. That just must be bad. Not only just too many people, but too many of the wrong kind of people, too many people who were different from us. It is no question that at the turn of the 20th century, this anti-urban reaction is deeply xenophobic and uh, in, in some ways religiously bigoted as well. I'll, I'll explain what I mean. Uh, um, cities are growing at this moment for two reasons. One, Americans are leaving the farm, uh, leaving the countryside and moving in. And immigrants increasingly from Southern and Eastern Europe are also flocking to places like New York and Boston and Chicago. Those immigrants, of course, are viewed by, uh, you know, sort of old stock Americans, those white Anglo-Saxon Protestants as absolutely terrifying. Uh, they are not Protestants, they are Catholics. And the amount of anti-Catholic bigotry now associated, uh, and you can see it in the rhetoric of the time with the American city is astonishing. Uh, and those who aren't Catholics, many of them coming from places like Poland and the Russian empire are Jews. Uh, and that's even worse. So there is absolutely a xenophobic response uh, to what's going on inside the American city. By the, by the First World War, the American city, New York, Chicago, uh, Boston, Philadelphia, are among maybe the most heterogeneous places on the planet. Uh, the people from all different uh, cultural backgrounds, religious traditions, linguistic traditions. Uh, you can walk from one end of Chicago to the other in 1914 and not hear a word of English all day long. You'll hear German, you'll hear Norwegian, you'll hear Yiddish, Italian, Polish, Russian, Ukrainian, Lithuanian, and on and on it goes. And so for lots of these, uh, uh, as I said, old stock Americans, that's bad, just on its face. 
I think you heard the echo of that in 2020 uh, during the presidential campaign. What are, who lives in cities? All those kinds of people we old stock Americans really disapprove of. They, they make us nervous, they make us uncomfortable. So that's the first part of this. The second part of it is that cities in the, in the early 20th century are faced with a problem of how to make life livable. Growing as fast as they are, chaotic as they are, assimilating, absorbing people from all over the world uh, with all of these, as I've already said, religious differences and, and languages and so forth. What people in cities realize is that the only way that cities are gonna work if, is if government steps in to make it possible. Charity is no good. Here's one of those progressive era reformers, Benjamin Marsh in 1908. Government must step in because charity is only a Band-Aid. Uh, it makes, as I said, what, what government does, city government does is to make it possible now for literally millions of people to live in New York City or in Chicago or, or in Philadelphia. Um, Here's an image, I love to show this image to my students because what you're seeing here is right, again, right around the First World War, this image I think was taken in 1915, you're seeing a sewer project uh, being dug in the city of Philadelphia. Think about that for a moment. I always tell my students, you know, uh, the internet, your Wi-Fi is as nothing as compared to indoor plumbing. You can go for a week without your TikTok and who cares? You go for a week without your indoor plumbing and you come talk to me about it. This is what happens in cities uh, in, in the first quarter of the 20th century. Uh, uh, outhouses replaced with indoor plumbing. Uh, water from a well replaced now with potable water from a municipal water source, right? This is a kind of a miracle, really, that all of these people who wake up in New York or Philadelphia can turn on a spigot and get safe drinking water. It's astonishing, this, but, but this only happens because the government has stepped in. People who are part of this anti-urban American tradition have a deep suspicion of government and of what I'll call the public sphere. Uh, as Americans, we are supposed to believe in a kind of libertarian, independent, private world where we do things for ourselves. Uh, for anti-urbanists, uh, the city is it, it, it's like two steps away from communism. Uh, and I'm not exaggerating here. I'm pulling from the language uh, that, that people used, especially in the first half of the 20th century in, in essays and articles and whatnot. And it's actually true. Um, it's, uh, so cities are spending enormous amounts of money doing enormous kinds of civic improvement projects. Uh, in, and, and this is all over these now big industrialized cities. I'm showing you again an image from Philadelphia. If you've ever been, you'll recognize on the left-hand side of the slide, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. But what you're looking at in total is one of these civic improvement projects, uh, which was completed in the 1920s to create a grand boulevard uh, with the art museum at one end, city hall at the other end, park space, other institutional buildings, the, the main branch of the Philadelphia Public Library is along the boulevard here uh, and so forth. Uh, that's what cities are up to uh, in the first quarter of the 20th century. And for many Americans, this is bad. Uh, this, we, we, should, we should be suspicious of all of this. I would say to you that it's the 1920s when America's urban moment arrives, uh, unequivocally, uh, undeniably. The census of 1920 announces for the first time that a majority, more than 50% of Americans now live in census designated areas as cities. Uh, it's, some of those cities are small by, I think, our modern standards, but nonetheless, this is a shock. Uh, from that nation of yeoman farmers that, that Thomas Jefferson kept banging on about now, 1920, 130 years later, uh, we're an urban nation in terms of our population. It's not just that as well. American culture is in the 1920s driven increasingly by the technologies of mass culture, 
uh, which in turn are increasingly informed by urban culture, uh, particularly the radio, uh, which uh, it, it's hard to, I think, overstate the case uh, for the profound influence of radio on American life in the 1920s. First commercial radio broadcast uh, actually takes place in, uh, in 1920, November 1920, uh, KDKA coming out of Pittsburgh. Uh, the first, as I said, commercial broadcast of radio. By the end of the decade, uh, two thirds of Americans, maybe 70% of Americans have a radio in their home. What they're listening to often uh, is stuff that's being produced now um, in the major cultural centers, New York and Chicago. So there's the Cotton Club, the jazz club in Harlem, uh, which had a live radio show uh, once a week. So you could conceivably be, be a, a farm kid in Kansas and be able to tune in to a broadcast from the Cotton Club on a nationally syndicated radio network like the Columbia Broadcasting System, CBS, uh, which is the first of the national radio networks. Uh, so, so even though you're there uh, on a farm someplace in a, in a rural place, you are now dialed in literally uh, to what's going on in America's uh, big cities. This is the same thing is true uh, with movies. Uh, that will become even more true in the 1930s, mass circulation magazines, and so on and so forth. So, so the American culture becomes increasingly urbanized in the 1920s as well. At the same time, I don't think it's coincidental that it's the 1920s, which sees really the, uh, I, I would say the, the, the first major backlash against that romantic moralized notion of the small town. Uh, the Village Virus, if you remember Sinclair Lewis's 1920 novel, Main Street, it's a nasty evisceration of uh, the town of Gopher Prairie, Minnesota, which was very, uh, which, was, which was based on Lewis's own hometown in Minnesota, uh, a place uh, of, of, of gossiping and backbiting and backwardness. Uh, and, uh, and there's H.L. Mencken, you know, contrasting um, the small town with uh, the smart set. Uh, there, that's what urban sophistication, uh, urban cosmopolitanism, uh, as against that conservative, stodgy, uh, and oppressive village life as well. That conflict, I think, comes into really sharp focus in the 1920s. 1925, uh, there we are in Dayton, Tennessee. Uh, you all know this story as well. It is the so-called Scopes Monkey Trial where the teaching of Darwin is put on trial. And here is uh, newspaper editor H.L. Mencken uh, reporting back uh, through his Baltimore newspaper uh, that, 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 that people out there in the forlorn backwaters uh, are filled with, as he puts it, Neanderthal man. Uh, a fanatic, rid of sense, and devoid of conscience. There's the split. I would remind you, if you have forgotten, that when the judge actually ruled in this case, Darwin lost. The state law in Tennessee was upheld. And after 1925, 11 other states, uh, mostly through the South, uh, which was the nation's most rural area, uh, pass similar laws banning the teaching of Darwinian evolution in the public schools. But there it is, that split between the urban and the rural, the backward and the progressive, the cosmopolitan and the, uh, and the Neanderthal. Okay, so given all of this, given that we are now, uh, you know, as I said, undeniably an urban nation, uh, we can't just moralize our way out of this dilemma the reaction that a number of that lots of Americans have is to figure out ways to decentralize this. Let, let's see if we can't get rid of our cities. If we can't get rid of them altogether, maybe we can disperse them. We can decentralize them. And that's a word that was used uh, all the time in the 1920s, 30s, and even into the 1950s. We're going to decentralize the city. So let me talk a little bit about that. 
it's in the 1930s that I think this agrarian myth uh, is um, comes back with a vengeance uh, during the Great Depression. Uh, this is Professor Patrick Quinn, who taught at Northwestern University. He never got behind uh, a pair of horses on a plow, but he fantasized about the moral fiber, the moral valence of uh, agricultural life. Urban life is essentially cooperative. And unlike what you may have learned in kindergarten, in this case, cooperation is not a good thing. Individualism, good. Cooperation, bad. You're looking at Franklin Roosevelt, who was referred to as the country squire. When Roosevelt became president in 1933, he began uh, to institute a whole series of programs designed to both decentralize cities and improve the conditions of rural life. Roosevelt himself was, I would put him squarely in the camp of these pro-rural, anti-urban uh, figures. And uh, it's worth remembering that we, we think of, of Roosevelt's New Deal. If we look at it a little more carefully, look at its constituent parts, what you're struck by is how much of the New Deal is really about rural places and agricultural places particularly. It's really a new deal for rural America. Roosevelt didn't have much use for American cities uh, and that's not where the bulk of the new deal was directed. So there's the Agricultural Adjustment Act, there's the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps all out in, uh, in rural places, uh, agricultural extension offices, soil conservation efforts, you still see uh, evidence of this. Uh, across Kansas today, no doubt. Um, it's not a mystery why uh, rural people, farmers loved Franklin Roosevelt. He brought all kinds of federal help to uh, agricultural regions that were staggering uh, under the Great Depression. Um, and again, you know, uh, if you remember the, uh, uh, the election of, eight, of 1936, Roosevelt running for his second term, he wins Kansas, uh, though can the Republican nominee is Kansas's own governor, Alf Landon. Not a great candidate, Alf Landon. Um, Dorothy Parker, the, the great, you know, the, the, the wonderful uh, humorist wrote after the election of uh, 1936 that if Alf Landon had given one more speech, FDR would have carried Canada. Uh, which is a great line, uh, but it, but but farmers love him because he's bringing the federal government to bear on their problems. The New Deal establishes a program to build well incipient suburbia, uh, new towns out in the countryside to draw away people out of cities of, uh, and and resettle them in places that are much less urban. Initially, this New Deal New Towns program was gonna build nearly 30 of these. Eventually, only three of them were ever built, one outside uh, Milwaukee, one outside Cincinnati, and one outside Washington, DC. But here again uh, is another example of how we're, what the, 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 the solution to the problem of the city is to get people out of the city, not to solve the problems uh, themselves. It's during this period as well that I think uh, we see this remarkable rise of a rural nostalgia. Some of you may have been, I hope you've been, uh, to Greenfield Village, which is uh, an extraordinary museum constructed by Henry Ford. Uh, it's in Deerfield. It's not actually that far away from, uh, from the, the, the great, uh, 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 River Rouge plant uh, that that uh, that Henry Ford built. What Henry Ford began to do uh, was, as he got older, was to simply collect buildings associated with America's 19th century history, and put them on the backs of train cars and bring them. and And he set up this kind of ersatz village that he called Greenfield. It's a monument to the pre-industrial, to the age of horsepower, uh, literally, uh, and a, 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 a monument to that simpler time that Henry Ford both remembered as a kid and had destroyed. Uh, the very first building that he collects as part of this effort to build Greenfield Village is his own 
um, a, a house, his, his, his own uh, childhood home, which was going to be demolished, yes, because they were widening a road to make room for those Model Ts uh, that Henry Ford kept cranking out. Uh, so this becomes now the image of American, uh, of the American past. Uh, you know, it's, it's little workshops, blacksmiths and, uh, and, and uh, barrel makers. Uh, and and it, it has nothing to do with the industrial age that Ford was so central in creating. You know, these books as well, I assume, uh, the first of them published in 1935, there's Laura Ingalls Wilder, uh, Little House on the Prairie. Uh, what we ought to remember was that she wrote this, she's quite uh, explicit about this in her correspondence. She wrote Little House on the Prairie as a great protest against the New Deal. Uh, she desperately hated that government was now stepping in to solve the problems of struggling people. And she wanted to write this, uh, this fable about uh, how, how a family stays together and, and solves its own problems. These became wildly popular, as I'm sure you are all aware. Uh, of course, Laura Ingalls Wilder, that, she, she based it on her own life but it wasn't really what happened in her own life. Uh, her family, the Ingalls, um, homestead in uh, Minnesota in 1863. 1863 is important because it's in 1863 that federal troops clear out uh, the last of the, there's, there's, there's an enormous conflict, a war in Minnesota um, uh, with the Sioux, uh, federal troops clear out native people in order to make it possible for people like the Ingalls to move in and start farming in the first place. There's, there's the role of government that, that Laura Ingalls Wilder never quite wanted to acknowledge. But in fact, Pa, Pa Wilder, um, was a terrible farmer. Uh, they, they moved all over the place uh, repeatedly all through her childhood. They finally wind up settling in a, a, a town because it's the only way they're gonna be able to make any kind of a living. Uh, and in fact, uh, they, 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 this, there's nothing nostalgic. It would seem like a pretty terrible uh, and unsuccessful life in all kinds of ways, but never mind. Uh, as you'll remember many of you in the 70s, these books were repackaged as a high budget, uh, high production uh, TV series that ran for years and years and years. And lots and lots of people fell in love with that world of gingham dresses and hand chopped wood and all the rest of it. Though, as I said, uh, this was a history that never really happened. 1939, uh, we're at the end of the Great Depression. We're really now, the Second World War is looming. Uh, the Second World War has really begun uh, in, in lots of parts of the world, including Africa, Spain, uh, and, uh, and, and the Far East. Uh, it, it's, it's begun in Europe as well, uh, though, though the invasion of Poland will take place in September. Uh, the New York World's Fair, which, which opened uh, in May and ran for the whole summer of 1939, offered Americans an opportunity to see what it called the world of tomorrow, the modernism of it. There is what was called the Trilon and Perisphere, the symbols, these, these, these futuristic, very abstracted notions pointing our way to a brave future. But what you saw uh, was a very particular kind of future. The most popular exhibit at the fair was the Futurama uh, exhibit. Uh, not the cartoon, uh, this was the original Futurama, and you can see people snaking their way into this. Um, it's sponsored by General Motors in the General Electric Pavilion. Uh, General Motors sponsors Futurama, and what it presents is what the American city will look like in 1960, 20 years into the future. Remarkable. Okay, so what did you see? Well, there's, uh, there are guys building it. Uh, give you a nice sense of the scale of this modernistic city now. Um, when you bought your ticket, you got this one again, fabulous stuff. You bought your ticket, you got to sit in one of these plush chairs and, and the, you rotated around the entire city model. 
So you got to see it from all different angles in this, uh, in this rotating uh, dome. And what you saw was a city of uh, high-speed roads, uh, big tall skyscrapers, cleared out of all of those messy, congested, uh, dense urban neighborhoods. Uh, and this is what the city is going to look like. Uh, did I mention sponsored by General Motors? Yeah. So you'll all be driving your General Motors cars on these high speed roads, zipping in and out, uh, going to work in one of these big office towers. This is 1939. And this is how people imagining, imagine rebuilding the American city. Well, it works or rather it comes to pass or rather it's enormously influential. Let's jump over the Second World War because these discussions about, about cities, city planning, of course, take a pause. Let's go to the post-war period and let me talk about urban renewal. Uh, one of two major federal programs that had as its goal, uh, the rebuilding of American cities and in essence, clearing them out of all those things we've always been a little scared of, all those things we've always been a little suspicious of. Uh, there's an urban renewal project there, you can see, because much of what it meant initially was demolition. Starts in 1949 uh, as a housing program. Uh, President Truman uh, promising a decent home in a decent environment for Americans. There is an enormous housing crisis after the Second World War he wants to do something about it. And it's clear that the private market isn't solving this problem, not building units fast enough to meet the demand the government should step in. Five years later, it's re-upped and expanded uh, so that now city as, cities and city agencies uh, are permitted to use eminent domain. That is to say the seizing of property. Uh, if that property has been deemed blighted. Now, let me do a plug for next week's talk, uh, because I think what I'm talking about here dovetails very nicely with that talk on redlining that's going to be offered a week from tonight. How do you define blight? Who gets to define blight? Who wins and who loses in the definition of what's going to get seized, what's going to get torn down, who's going to get moved out, who's going to get moved in? Uh, what this means is that lots and lots of things got torn down in American cities. Uh, and what was built, well, were, were big projects, office buildings, uh, uh, apartments, public housing projects, in some cases, institutions, universities in particular, made uh, took tremendous advantage of urban renewal to expand their campuses, uh, to build new dormitories, new classroom buildings, and so on and so forth. Uh, but what it did really was to tear apart American cities by way of trying to renew them. Here's Minneapolis, for take one example here, in an area called the Gateway Section. Uh, that's what it looks like before urban renewal comes to town. It's a 22 block area, square block area, all of which torn down 200 plus buildings. And by 1970, 1975, maybe it looked like that. Because uh, if you're going to, all those people in their General Motors cars driving back and forth on those uh, high speed roads, well, they have to have someplace to park. So this whole area was leveled in order to make room for surface parking lots. There's Boston. Uh, the area on the left uh, is before urban renewal. The area on the right is what replaced it. That's the unbelievably awful uh, government center uh, in Boston. That's where the city hall is and, and other city offices. Uh, I lived in Boston for a while. You, you'd actually walk out of your way to avoid going over that plaza because it was just so ugly and, and the wind would blow really, it's just lifeless. Anyway, so there's another example of what urban renewal did, uh, tearing out the old and then replacing it with things like these. Because in fact, and this is the great journalist uh, who wrote for Fortune Magazine, William White, most of what's going on here are designed by people who don't like cities. They want to get rid of all of the things that actually make cities cities, uh, like, like, uh, like all of that diversity, like all of the action, chaos, activity, uh, and so forth. Uh, we're going to clear all of that out. We're going to make it nice, neat, orderly, and unbelievably boring. Uh, that's the goal of urban renewal projects. 
The second piece of this, which happens simultaneously, is the building of interstate highways. 1956, Congress passes the Interstate Highway System, uh, Interstate Highway Act to build 42,000 miles of interstate highways. Um, this is a federal program. This is big government. This is uh, federal government paid 90 cents on every dollar uh, for, for a highway project, an interstate project starting in 1956. That too, these highways initially are designed to get people in and out of cities as fast as possible. Here's the Rondo section of St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, this is what it looks like uh, before the highway comes in and here we go. There the construction starts and there it's finished. And what you can see in this image, I, I like this image from the air, is, is that this, this is uh, Interstate 94, I believe. Um, it's like an enormous scar that has been ripped right through the heart of what was once a fairly populated urban neighborhood, black as it happens and not coincidentally. And then look at the space around that road, right? It just becomes deadened. It becomes warehouses or, or industrial, or again, just more surface parking lots. That's what these highways did over and over and over again. Here, I teach about 45 minutes north of Cincinnati. Here's the African-American neighborhood of Kenyon Bar from the air. This is about 1950. Then the interstate project comes through. Uh, there's a wonderful series of photographs of these engineers who come through uh, with, they're, they're almost like cue cards. Um, these are all the buildings that are about to get torn down. They're the kids who shop at this market. Uh, there's the, the guy who runs the market. Uh, there's almost something morbid about this because this, that, that, that neighborhood is about to be demolished. Uh, and these photographs provide this record of it, uh, almost like, like you know, sort of a, a death sentence record. Uh, and that's what it looks like today. A neighborhood which once had 26,000 people now has fewer than five. Uh, that's Interstate I-75 there. Um, this, you know, take your pick, uh, or how about we do this? How about we go to Topeka? Uh, and there is, the Keyway section of town, there's the urban renewal area. I, I, I trust this is all familiar to you, uh, but I thought I'd pull up some of these images. Uh, so you can see that this area, densely populated, single family homes on these lots. You can, you can see the way it's all platted out next to the river there. Uh, here's what they proposed to put in, 1959. There's the construction underway, 1964, and you can see what's been cleared out. You've got to clear it all out. Uh, so where did those people go? Well, nobody was paying much attention. Uh, did they leave town altogether? Did they have to double up? Did some of them become homeless? Nobody knows. Uh, and here's what it looks like when it's more or less completed by 1973. City after city, uh, over and over, this is how cities were torn apart and decentralized uh, under, the, under the programs of urban renewal and highway construction. The result of this, I'm going to give you uh, some figures of, from uh, some population figures here. 1950, uh, the big American cities, uh, and look at the decline. New York City loses almost a million people over the course of 30 years. Chicago, about uh, over half a million people. Um, th this is a period of urban crisis. Uh, as, as cities are torn up, as, uh, as people are now fleeing in large numbers, as these cities are contracting uh, in terms of their population, culminating in the mid and late 70s. Uh, some of you may remember this episode when New York City was on the verge of bankruptcy. President Gerald Ford refused to bail the city out. Uh, New York City couldn't borrow any more money. Uh, it, it, it was shut out of all the financial markets because of, of the urban exodus, the loss of tax uh, revenues, et cetera, et cetera. And in 1977, as people watched the World Series on ABC television, they heard Howard Cosell, the voice of ABC Sports, look up from this New York Yankees game from Yankee Stadium to say, ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx are burning. Uh, that symbolized that sense of these cities now finally in collapse. 
which was cheered by a number of writers, critics, policymakers, as if somehow about time. However, we didn't all go back to the farm. Uh, we should be clear about that. Uh, rural areas have been in even more precipitous decline. Uh, we'll just look at some numbers about farms, right? There's 1950, 5 million plus independently owned farms down to 2 million across 30 years. Farm population uh, drops by more than half uh, during that 30 year period. Uh, the farming way of life is now a myth and that's a professor at the University of Minnesota in 1968. It's, you know, it, it, here we go, it's uh, rest in peace. Uh, and there's a graph just to, uh, to, to punctuate the point, uh, the drop uh, of farming from 1900 through 2000, the drop in the number of farms. Likewise, economic stagnation across much of rural America. Uh, they, uh, here again, at Minneapolis uh, Fed uh, official James Herder, Farm subsidies by 1959 are the second largest piece of the federal budget, the first being defense, the second farm subsidies. So again, all of those people pursuing that independent way of life, of course, are now deeply, deeply dependent on the federal budget. Uh, states with the highest percentage of, uh, of federal money, the, the largest disparity in what's uh, called the balance of payments, how much money does the state send in, to Washington in the form of taxes versus how much does it get in the form of programs. The states with the highest ratio there are all uh, predominantly rural states. Rural poverty by 1990 was estimated to be at one in five. Higher, I would point out, than poverty rates in most American cities. By 1985, during the midst of the so-called farm crisis of the 1980s, rural America became a charity case. It's worth remembering that the Farm Aid concert, there's Willie Nelson, uh, was inspired by a summertime benefit concert to benefit uh, famine victims in Ethiopia, uh, the so-called Live Aid concert. Um, that there would be an analogy here between what was happening in Ethiopia and now what was happening in the farm belt is, is quite, quite remarkable. Let's zoom forward to the, to the start of this century uh, because cities now, starting really in the 1990s, have made a tremendous comeback, in part by trying to undo the mistakes of the 1940s, 50s, 60s, uh, and 70s. Um, cities now uh, are, are increasing in population again for the first time in uh, many decades. Uh, and so too, uh, their economic vitality is back. Uh, New York, Chicago, um, Pittsburgh, uh, Philadelphia. Rural America, however, has not really recovered. Uh, from the farm crisis of the 1980s through the Great Recession of 2007, uh, rural America has suffered much more profoundly uh, from, from the shifts in the American economy. Here in Kansas, well, 1900, 78% of Kansans are rural. By 1950, it had dropped to below 50. By 2015, mirroring the national numbers, by the way, 70% of you live in metro areas. Uh, that shouldn't come as too much of a surprise, but here's the 2020 census figures. They'll be adjusted a little bit, I suspect, but nonetheless, uh, 80 out of 105 counties in the state of Kansas lost population. Uh, and those are the rural counties. Uh, you can see here, let's move this out of the way if I can, uh, that um, the population growth in Kansas uh, are all in the 10 largest counties, population loss in all the other counties uh, over the course of the last um, 20 years. Again, mirroring the national trends pretty well. Oops, sorry, let me get that. There we go. And there's the map just to, uh, uh, to punctuate that. So there are your three largest metro areas. They are growing. And there's the rest of the state with populations that are either uh, flatlining or indeed declining. 
These are what I have called uh, in an essay, landscapes of loss. Uh, there's a farmhouse sitting out there in the middle of what was once a farm, but of course, we don't do farming on that scale anymore. That's still a, 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 an area of crop growth. It's just that it's, uh, it's part of a much larger consolidated farm operation. You don't need the house anymore. You don't need the farmers who used to live there. Uh, there's a main street, uh, which again has become typical of a lot of these uh, small towns that used to be at the center of farm communities. It could be Ohio where, where I teach, it could be Indiana or Illinois. Uh, or Wisconsin, it could be lots of these rural places now where, where again, the economy has left and it hasn't come back. I'm gonna give you just a moment here to read this lovely poem by Iowa's uh, poet laureate, Ted Couser, uh, who I think um, does a nice job in this poem called Something Went Wrong. Something went wrong, they say. Uh, and I think that does capture this sense we now have. Uh, we've moved from nostalgia to a kind of mournfulness when we talk about the disappearance of rural life. And in many ways, uh, the problems we used to associate with, uh, with urban areas have become the problems of rural areas. And certainly in my part of the, of the rural world, it's uh, drug addiction, uh, opioids in particular, but uh, but meth as well. Uh, and and as, as people go, so goes the economy. Uh, metropolitan areas have recovered the jobs they lost do, during the Great Recession. Rural counties, many of them, maybe most of them have not. You know, the red counties there are counties that are still behind their 2007 population, uh, sorry, uh, employment figures. And yet, we are still an anti-urban nation, uh, despite uh, the fact that our population and our economy reside in metropolitan areas, uh, we still somehow cling to the idea that Americans really belong in a small town or on a farm, though that really hasn't been true for over a century. Um, and as I said, it has culminated uh, or it has been amplified by the political discourse that we've had in the very recent past. Okay, I'll stop there. Let me get out of this. We'll stop sharing the screen here. And I will look forward to your questions. All right, thank you very much um, for that presentation. That was very interesting. We've had a few questions come in. Uh, let me ask you real quick, Dr. Khan, if, uh, I have read a little bit about a post-COVID urban exodus, maybe on a smaller scale than what you've been talking about. Yeah. Could you that? Sure. That's a, I, I was I was hoping you weren't going to ask that question. Um, I was hoping you weren't going to ask that question largely because I'm a historian, and so I like to look at the past. Uh, I I you know I have a hard enough time with that dealing with the present. Yeah. So there has been some population volatility uh, in in some cities. There has been a loss. Um, not on the scale that we saw back after the Second World War, to be sure. And I think it's probably too early yet to, I think the dust is going to take longer to settle on COVID than we were all anticipating. And I, and I, you know, I think on the one hand, uh, we're seeing that people may not want to go back to the office. I think that's been a surprise. People want to work at home, or at least some of them do. They want to keep working at home. At the same time, uh, in the places I've been to over the last year, uh, you wouldn't know that there's anything uh, going, that anything wrong uh, based on the amount of new construction that's going on. And I'm looking at New York, I'm looking at Philadelphia, New Haven, Connecticut, Columbus, Ohio, Cincinnati. Uh, it, it, it sure seems like the construction boom and its apartment buildings and its office buildings, that's still going on. Uh, so as I said, I, I, I wanna answer that question probably about two years from now uh, to see what that really looks like. Okay. That's my cop out. <laughs> That's fine. I want to mention to the participants that if anybody has any questions, they can certainly pop them into the chat and we will relay them. 
Uh, we were also wondering on our end, a couple of things. Um, one of our staff wants to know, uh, he says there were a lot of urban renewal projects in the 60s that have now aged. Do you see many efforts to return those back to a state that they were originally in? As in like a historic preservation kind of thing? Sure. Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> um, th there has been some discussion of this. Uh, and, and I think largely speaking, those projects are coming down. So in the 90s in particular, the, the big, in some ways, infamous public housing projects started to be demolished. And they have almost now all been demolished and been replaced with uh, smaller scale uh, kind of townhomes or row houses, uh, single family dwellings, as opposed to the you know, enormous kind of Stalinist uh, apartment towers that, that used to be there. So I don't see a whole lot of desire to, to keep those places. The other thing I would, I would note is that um, there have been a couple of places now where they're, I'm thinking of Boston, I'm thinking of Milwaukee, uh, New York, uh, where some of those highway projects have actually been demolished and removed uh, because they were felt they had done such damage to the fabric of the city that it would actually be better to, to literally tear them down uh, or in Boston's case, bury the road underground so that the city can come back and be itself again. Okay, thank you very much. Um, have you, are you familiar with the 3030 by 30 project? Is that something you've- Yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit familiar with it, yeah. Okay, um, do you see that as having any uh, effect on uh, rural populations? Yeah, it's a good question. And again, it's one of those, you know, I have, uh, looking into the future is, is not my forte. Though I think I do a better job of it than most economists. I just don't get paid as much um, predicting the future. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think I've spent a lot, a lot of time over the last couple of years working on this book project, uh, thinking about what is the future for rural places. Um, and you know, there are lots of different answers to that, but overall there has to be a rationale. Uh, and there has to be a, 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 a reason that people can return to that kind of life. And I'm not sure 30, 30 by 30 is necessarily going to offer that kind of answer. Okay. Um, you gave a lot of interesting, <laughs> when you were mentioning the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, and I had already been thinking about those. <laughs> so yeah. Put it out of my head. And I was also thinking of all the other things that I read as a child. You know, I read a lot of uh, Dickens, and of yep. course, you had a lot in there about not in our country, but in uh, in England about the evil of the cities and how horrible they were portrayed. Yeah. As being. Um, so, would you say that the the contention between urban and rural is not unique to the United States? I know that that's your specialty, but right. do you want to speak on that at all? Yeah, no, no, I think that's a great question. Uh, and, and I think you're right that there is this tension that you, and you can find it uh, in lots of other places and through uh, long periods of time. Uh, I, I mean, after all, if we go back to the Hebrew Bible, uh, paradise is a garden and Sodom and Gomorrah are both cities, right? So there is something pretty deeply rooted at least in the Western tradition about this. I do think that there's something particularly virulent about this in the United States. I'll give you an example. In the 1970s, 60s and 70s, smart people, people at think tanks uh, and whatnot, routinely talked about how New York City was simply doomed and it was gonna go away. They talked about Boston in the same terms. There's nothing to be done. It's just gonna you know, kind of wash into the harbor and that's that and we'll move on. Uh, they were wrong about that, but it, it, it's, it's impossible to imagine any French policymaker saying something similar about Paris or London uh, or Vienna uh, or, or take your pick, right? I think the extent to which Americans can talk in those terms uh, is, is a little, it makes us different in this regard than, than uh, the English or other continental Europeans. Okay. Um, 
We have a question that goes back to the, the early part of your presentation regarding the tyranny of Wyoming. The oh. <laughs> we knew this was gonna happen. The suggestion seems to be that rural areas uh, are given unfair representation by virtue of the electoral college. Wouldn't yeah. ending the electoral college just create a tyranny of the densely populated areas? No, what, what, um, what ending the electoral college would do uh, would be to make every vote count equally. Um, and I actually think it would have a, a, a terrific effect on how we run these national elections, because at the moment, uh, nobody has to campaign in Mississippi and nobody has to campaign in Massachusetts because those votes are already, you know, we all know which way that's going to go. And the 30 percent or the 40 percent who are going to vote for the other candidate, it doesn't matter. The Electoral College will simply tally uh, the winner. If every vote actually counted in a presidential election, then candidates would have to campaign for every vote. Uh, and I think that would be a, a, a terrific improvement. Um, the, the, the way in which rural votes are, are more heavily weighted has been really well documented by political scientists. This is at the national level with the Electoral College to be sure, and the way the Senate is constructed. But this is also true uh, at state levels uh, where rural districts have been demonstrated repeatedly to, uh, th there's, there, there are more represent there's more representation of rural areas in state houses than urban areas in those same state houses. In fact, the Supreme Court case which established the principle of one person, one vote, which I think was decided in 1961, was not a national, didn't, didn't come from a national election, came from the state of Illinois, where um, three quarters of the people in Illinois lived in Cook County, but Cook County had only 10% of the seats in the state house in Springfield because those district maps had been drawn in 1900 uh, and had not changed for over half a century. You, you see this in lots of states where there's a big uh, dominating metropolitan area, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, Illinois, uh, that, that rural uh, uh, districts are, are more heavily represented. So as I said, political scientists have, have crunched these numbers pretty, pretty definitively. What do you think the campaigning, what would that look like if people- were What would what look like? campaigning for every vote rather than for the urban votes? No, no, sorry, let me let me clarify. What I mean is that right now, if I'm a candidate for uh, the presidency, uh, I know basically 40 of the 50 states, I know which way they're gonna vote. They're either gonna vote for me or they're gonna vote for my opponent. That's just, I don't really need to campaign there uh, because, because of, of the, the way the voter uh, registrations are, the way the voting patterns are, and so on and so forth. So really, we're only um, uh, campaigning on the so-called swing states. If we actually did away with the Electoral College, every state would matter. There would not be states which get more attention because they are swing states, and states which get almost no attention because they're locked in. Right. That's, I guess, what I'm really saying is that if if we elected the president based on the majority of the people who vote for a person, that would mean you'd have to campaign in every state and every vote would matter. Right. I was just wondering what that would look like as far as um, uh, campaign financing. You know, if they, they are oh. ever so much money to just to just campaign in certain spots if they have to campaign in the entire country. I'm wondering oh, why. well, yeah. So that's a whole other can of worms, which uh, which I'm not going to open up this evening. <laughs> Well, we do have a follow-up question from another person in the chat asking for clarification whether you're saying that urban areas um, should dictate election outcomes by virtue of the fact that they have more people. Well, uh, the uh, 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 all I'm all I'm really positing is that um, what we, what we have, and it is different than any other democratic society, is a system where. Uh, the person who wins the most votes might not win the election. Uh, that's, that's how we have structured our presidential politics. So if it means that, uh, if, if what we're talking about is who wins a majority of votes, that seems to me a, a fairly defensible democratic principle. Uh, and if those votes 
are now increasingly metropolitan votes, then candidates will have to appeal to those voters uh, because they are the majority of us. Okay. Um, we have time for one more question. Let me just check the chat. Um, unless something pops up and either of you folks have anything. Uh, that was very interesting. It did, it did bring to mind a bit of the uh, rem remembering the kind of back to the land movement of yep. say the 60s, 70s and you addressed yep. that a bit. Um, and there's a lot more, there was a lot more uh, little trails we could go down on this one. You're right in saying that our, our next uh, month's uh, program, and I don't, it's July 8th. Our, our next program is July 8th at 6.30. I hope you can all join us. Uh, that is a great program coming up. You referred to it. It's uh, Andrew Gustafson, Curator of Interpretation of the Johnson County Museum in Overland Park. He's going to discuss redlining, which was the disinvestment of some neighborhoods and populations in favor of others, often done on the basis of race. And it began as a private practice and it became enshrined in federal policy during the Great Depression. Uh, so I'm hoping all of you can join us for that on July 8th. Dr. Khan, I want to thank you again. That was an incredible presentation. Oh. We all uh, enjoyed it very much. Could have heard a pin drop in our, my little room here. <laughs> well, thank, <laughs> um, you, thank so you so much. much. Thanks for uh, having me. And so, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And thanks from all of us at the museum after hours. Thank you again. And everybody have a wonderful evening.